Um, thanks for having me. Um, glad to be uh, your last memory of the Great Lakes Expo. <laughs> We're going to make great memories together. Um, so if, if you were tasked with thinking about what's, what's important in storing uh, these vegetables for several months, and so I should say that my work in this area really has been driven by working with Vermont's uh, diverse, smaller uh, to medium-sized farms. Uh, and primarily looking at longer term storage, so storage of winter crops, uh, winter squash, root crops, etc. Um, so I, I want to preface this discussion with, with that. That said, most of the um, factors that lead to success in long term storage of these crops also help short turnaround crops as well for uh, more rapid delivery to market. So. Let's, let's just talk about these five crops for now. I'm going to use these sort of as crop case studies in talking about post-harvest handling and storage. Just shout, shout out, I mean, carrots, onions, potatoes, cabbage, butternut squash, or other winter squash. We've heard one concern already um, with some surface quality issues. Um, what else, what, what would we be wanting to pay attention to here? Clean, cleanliness, clean. Okay, so okay. clean crops going into storage. Right, okay, good. Air temperature, very good, yeah. Humidity, Humidity thank you. Any, anything else? Which ones you can't store with other ones? Good, so yeah, uh, crop compatibility with each other or maybe even with regard to temperature and humidity conditions, right? Great. Maybe segregation of lots? Oh, interesting, okay. Segregation of lots, uh, harvest lots or, yeah, okay, great. Sanitation of storage? Awesome. Yeah, sanitation of storage rooms. Yeah, we, we had a little chat about that on Tuesday, actually. Yeah, so, good. Yeah, so this is a, um, th this session is sort of a condensed version of a day long workshop that I developed with some SARE funding on um, storage, uh, storage practices and systems. And when I do this in a condensed version, I like to just pull out the top 10 things, sort of Dave Letterman style and uh, say, you know, what, what are the key things to remember? So first thing is, and if folks have to leave, you're going to get the bulk of the presentation on this slide. First thing to remember is crops that are in storage are still alive. So there's still respiration happening. Um, that's one of the main reasons we look at controlling temperature. We're trying to control that respiration rate and keep it low so that we deliver harvested quality to the customer. Calling it, <coughs> sorry, calling it harvest. Uh, remembering that storage is a hotel, not a hospital, right? So it's not a swinger hotel, Christine, but it is, <laughs> it is a hotel. Things that are sick going into storage are most likely not going to get better. So um, we're, we're, not, we're not going into a hotel. Pre-cooling, so getting, this, getting product down to temperature as quickly as possible going into storage, you get that respiration rate down quickly. Um, again, you're look, looking to preserve the harvested quality as long as you can, getting to the customer. Um, curing, in the case of squash and some other storage crops, giving it a designated period of time, an intentional period of time to develop that nice suit of armor around it to cure, whether it's harvest wounds or uh, insect damage or um, cultivator blight um, around uh, the, the outer surface, giving it protection and storage. Zoned storage, uh, so the idea that we may have different crops needing different conditions for storage, how do we do that um, on a small scale uh, and cost effectively. Temperature controls, um, I could speak all day about thermostats, but I won't. Uh, we got one slide, but we'll talk a little bit about temperature controls and the importance there. Uh, humidity management, somebody mentioned that in the, the intro here, they're also very important. We're trying to minimize water loss and therefore weight loss of the crop. Monitoring of those things, um, even without going into the, the room, ergonomics and how we move product uh, post harvest. And then paying attention to construction of, of the uh, of this space, in particular smooth and cleanable materials. Uh, somebody was asked, brought up the idea of sanitation in a store, in a uh, cooler. It begins with good materials. I maintain a uh, site uh, with a number of storage related resources. Um, I will be posting, uh, there'll be links in throughout this presentation. They all essentially start with go.uvm.edu and then slash a keyword. 
The main site is storage for this topic. Okay, so fresh produce is alive. It's um, still breathing, releasing heat, losing moisture, it's getting sick, even in storage, um, and it can even die, right? I am looking to update this slide if there are any volunteers who want to wear vegetable costumes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we should, right? Yeah. Uh, post harvest, again, is a hotel, not a hospital. And it's, be, and it's because of respiration that uh, we do a bunch of things we do. And so respiration is really converting oxygen and glucose and other sugars um, into heat, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. So this is a chemical reaction. This is like an engineer's view of produce, right? There's a chemical reaction going on here, almost like combustion, right? So it's, this is happening in storage. The way we control the rate of that, because we really like to deliver as much of that goodness as we can, the way we control that is with temperature control. This is showing respiration rate of raspberries relative to uh, storage temperature. Um, and uh, the black is the uh, respiration rate versus temperature. So you can see a dramatic respiration rate reduction with temperature, and that increases shelf life. So ideal post-harvest conditions, um, going in storage, uh, Vicki mentioned no disease, clean crops going in, um, we want to heal whatever we can or call out uh, visible damage from the crops going into storage, market that early if you can. Um, chilling injury is, uh, my guess, uh, is, is partly what you might be seeing uh, in the squash. We'll talk about squash in a minute. but. Um, uh, we want to initiate the cold chain, so we want to pre-cool crops and uh, have them in storage as quickly as possible. Uh, sort of best practices within an hour of harvest, if you can do even better, then that's great. Uh, we want to increase humidity to avoid desiccation in most storage crops, not all. Um, uh, Dry-cured dry crops such as onions and garlic, uh, you actually want to have lower, lower humidity. And then ethylene is a naturally occurring ripening hormone. Uh, if anybody's worked in apples, you're probably well versed in ethylene. It's not something um, that comes up all the time in other storage crops. So I like to make a point of pointing it out. So it, it's a naturally occurring um, hormone. It um, leads to ripening and is the result of ripening in crops. And so it's one reason why we tend to not want to store vegetable crops in the same place as apples, because apples are high producers of ethylene. Most uh, long-term storage crop, vegetable storage crops, are sensitive to ethylene. Um, there are some storage crops that are very sensitive to ethylene, but also are minor producers, which is to say they're not zero producers. So carrots and cabbage, for example. Carrots can self-bitter if they're uh, stored without some ventilation in the room. They will, they're minor producers of ethylene, but they're ultra sensitive to it, so they, um, they're their own worst enemy. So chilling injury real quick, so nothing really freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the, um, and it's usually a bit lower. However, one of the points I like to make is many crops have, suffer from chilling injury above where we think. Uh, squash is one of those, uh, storage squash, and it's very, it's somewhat variety dependent, and there are some squash varieties, winter squash varieties that are I, in my opinion, incorrectly referred to as winter squash or storage squash varieties because they, they really are pretty um, sensitive to this um, and don't keep very well. And so the, the point to remember is squash is going to suffer a chilling injury anytime it gets below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So the concern is not frost, it's 50 degrees in that, in that case. The, to add to that, um, you're not going to see it right away. It's cumulative and it's not visible until you've been in storage, generally for a couple of months. And so all of a sudden you start to see something in your storage squash and you say, I've got a storage issue, when really it happened a couple of months ahead. So it's interesting listening to the mechanical weed control to, uh, talk about you know planting times, uh, planting timing and harvest timing. And I was thinking about how that would tie in with harvest timing going into storage timing. So some, there might be some potential there. Relative humidity, uh, somebody over here mentioned relative humidity as a, um, a consideration or concern, something to pay attention to. And that's the measure of water moisture in the air. So this is, um, sorry, water vapor in the air. Um, a key point 
on, on this is we want water vapor in the air. We don't want liquid water in the cooler. Um, and so uh, creating high humidity without having lots of condensation or spraying lots of water in the cooler. And that gets to one of the um, concerns uh, on proto-safety and good agricultural practices, trying to minimize standing water, uh, especially in cool, cold environments um, where we have some pretty, um, um, pretty strong pathogens like Listeria amongst the Tigenes, which can survive in cold temperatures, especially if there's liquid water. So the best guide for post-harvest uh, conditions in crops is USDA Handbook 66. How many people have heard of Handbook 66 before? Awesome. Happy holidays. Okay. Handbook 66 is uh, 792 pages of pure post-harvest joy. Um, <laughs> So when you're sitting around the fire uh, and need something to read. Oh, I thought it was the bird. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 700 pages. Yeah. you got to get concise, man. So it is concise. So remember that this is covering, it's covering almost 200 crops. Oh, okay. So each crop is a chapter, three pages. So okay. it, it is broken down by chapter. There's even a chapter on respiratory metabolism, which is just... I mean, what more could you ask for? So, no, but there's a chapter on onions. It tells you, you know, um, just about everything you want to know about post-harvest uh, practices in each crop. Um, What's the latest um, update on it? It is. It was last updated in 2016, August 2016. Oh, okay. It is no longer printed. Uh, it's freely available as a PDF um, okay. online, but it's no longer printed. Um, so download it as a PDF. Bring it with you wherever you go. Um, so it gets into uh, everything from recommended storage conditions. Uh, if a crop benefits from curing, uh, a curing step that's that's captured in there as well, as, and including you know curing period, curing period, and curing conditions. Um, ideal storage temperature and humidity. It tells you a little bit about ethylene production rate and sensitivity in a crop. So uh, there there might be some surprises there. Um, chilling and freezing injury, so what temperatures to be concerned about in different crops, which can be very helpful. Um, they do get in a little bit to, um, they get a little bit into variety differences, um, and it is updated pretty regularly, uh, just about, uh, as long as I've been using it, it's been updated, I think, about every two years. So, it does stay pretty current. Okay, so this is a collection of some information from Handbook 66 on the five crops we talked about earlier. And you all did a great job identifying some of the things we, we would want to pay attention to that might differ between these crops. Given this new information, what, what's, what are some other differences you see? Well, the length of time that you're even able to keep it. Yep. It's pretty significantly different. Yep, storage duration, differences. Squashes, I mean, we do a lot of Hubbard squash, and, and you know, they always tell that you can store a Hubbard squash for six months, and, and we've had squash last that long if it goes in good, but like delicata is short season, we, butternut, it must be you know, reasonably short. They say that it can last a long time, but you know, I'm up north, so you can't listen to me. I, I'm way up north. I'm listening to you, it, and, and you're, you're echoing a lot of what I've seen. It, one, of the, one of the challenges is, for example, there's a chapter on winter squash in Handbook 66. There's a lot of different varieties of winter squash. Uh, and you're, you're highlighting the, exactly the same thing that we've seen, that there are, there are some varieties that really are, you know, marketed by Thanksgiving, yeah. even though they're winter squash. Right. Um, so, yeah. Are garlic and onion, are those pretty much the same? Pretty much, yeah, in terms of storage, yeah. Okay, storage density. So that's a, a measure of how much you can, f how much mass you can fit in a, say, a bin of of uh, storage. About temperature. Yeah. Different temperatures for different crops, right? Okay, go figure. Uh, different humidities for different crops. So there's some differences in temperature, different humidities, and so with squash and onion, you know, one of the reasons we have, well, I should have, why do we have lower humidity? For those, they're they, not moist on the outside. Yeah, they're dry surfaces, right? So I think about it as cardboard or paper. You want that in high humidity? What's going to happen? 
molds, mildews, right? Sure. So we want to keep humidity, humidity down there. Uh, respiration rate. What, what is this telling us? It's telling you that some crops give an awful lot more heat. Yeah. Yeah. And so, for example, squash, That this is exactly right. This is a measure of how much heat is essentially coming off of the crop in storage. And so we can use this to our benefit, first of all. We can have some freeze-protected storage with insulated walls, given that the crop is producing heat. Winter squash is a great example of that. It's giving off quite a bit of heat. It's also important if you're talking about a new refrigeration system, or talking with a refrigeration contractor, or trying to size, for example, a, a cool bot, a self-built cooler. Um, knowing how much heat the product is giving off is very helpful for making sure you have enough refrigeration capacity. Do you know how this relates to the gap? Are they asking for you to document all these things when you store products? So gaps and other produce safety systems are looking to make sure that you have control over the temperature of, uh, of your cooler primarily and that it's being uh, cleaned on a, on a regular basis, perhaps sanitized depending on the system, um, more so than are you, are you keeping things at the conditions that are optimal for product quality. They're more concerned about the produce safety right. aspects. Um, but a key part of that is knowing you have good control over conditions and that you have good control over the systems providing refrigeration. So if you're considering new storage um, in, uh, or multiple zones of storage, how much do you need? Um, it's, it can be a bit of a challenge to figure this out. I uh, put together an Excel spreadsheet-based crop planner, a crop storage planner, which um, lets you put in uh, pounds or tons of production and helps you get to uh, multiple crops and lets you get to, does a couple things, it converts those weights to volumes, and it also zones, it groups the, the crops based on their Handbook 66 storage conditions. So that you, you, you know, if you put in onions and potatoes and winter squash, you'll end up with three zones, and, it, and based on how much you've put in, it'll size those zones relative uh, to what you plan to grow. The other thing it does is it adds about 30% volume just for movement of air in the space, movement of people, and movement of product. Um, that tends to be another thing that gets overlooked. We tend to think about how much product we got to store, and we forget that we may actually have to get in there and move around and, uh, and take product out from the far corner. So what, what are some uh, storage systems that, uh, that work? Well, they're prefabricated um, panel-based systems on the right hand side these are you know you can get these delivered on a, a flatbed and they can lock the panels can lock together um, they're insulated um, their insulation sandwiched between uh, galvanized um, or powder coated steel um, you can build your own a uh, couple different examples here of different surfaces and finishes uh, we've had some people have good luck with um, Shipping containers, insulated shipping containers. The one challenge we see with those is they, they do end up being pretty tight, especially if you stack on uh, pallets, because they're, they're made to take pallets but be completely jam-packed full. So unless you're doing last-in, first-out type um, things, it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit tough. Or if you like to climb, it's OK. Um, We've been doing a lot of work looking at smooth and cleanable materials. By we, I mean myself and Andy, my colleague from UVM, um, looking at different surfaces to put over whatever a cooler is built out of. Uh, most of our growers are retrofitting coolers into uh, converted dairy barns, for example, or other um, buildings that have been used for other purposes. So they're stick framed and insulated, and then usually plywood or OSB particle board chipboard over it. Um, we'd like to go a step further and give uh, smooth and cleanable surfaces so that you can actually clean the cooler and then uh, sanitize uh, as needed. And so a very common material is dairy board or uh, FRP, fiber reinforced plastic. This is the white um, 
material you see on, um, in dairy parlors or um, convenience store restrooms uh, most often. Wall Tough is a recycled plastic version of that. We've had a number of growers who built up instead of out for storage rooms, so they're doing a lot of stacking, uh, higher stacks of uh, pallet bins, for example. And they've, they've opted for galvanized aluminum. You can get it in long sheets, so this is like roofing tin. Uh, so you can get that in long sheets and cover a lot of space quickly. Um, trust, there, there's three products in the bottom left there that uh, are relatively new or new to us that are kind of like a uh, twin wall polycarbonate you might see on a greenhouse end wall. Um, and so that they're a little bit more rigid and they can be installed without a backer board. So FRP is pretty, uh, pretty flimsy or flexible, so it needs a backer board to be installed against. These materials have more uh, structure to them, and so although they're more expensive, the material's more expensive per square foot, you need less material in your cooler and it installs more quickly. So there can be a savings in the end. Um, they also have tongue and groove locking uh, seams, which makes, uh, makes for a nice, um, Nice install, clean install. What we're trying to do is avoid bare wood uh, and liquid water. Uh, so bare wood and liquid water are going to lead to a number of things, uh, some of which are just unsightly. Others are uh, pathogens, potential pathogens, either plant pathogens, which are going to diminish your stored quality, or human pathogens, which are going to be a bigger deal. And so one of the things we'd like to see is if you have a uh, split refrigeration system, the evaporator is where you make cold air in the cooler, right? And they all have a pan underneath them. And despite the fact that they're called evaporators, what do they do to water? What comes off an evaporator? Condensation, yeah. right? <laughs> so despite the fact that they're called evaporators, they're evaporating refrigerant, which makes it cold, it's like a glass of cold water on a hot summer day. It's going to condense the water out of the air. And so that all falls to the bottom. Evaporator pans have a hole in the bottom of them. Um, that should be connected to a drain, and that drain should go somewhere intentional. Um, if you don't connect that to a drain, where does the liquid water go? Right, onto your winter squash. Right, yeah. So, so we, don't want, we don't want that. We want to have that drain somewhere intentionally. And so these are examples of some nice drains connected. Um, I think I have a slide. In a moment on Coolbots, we'll talk about, uh, have folks heard about Coolbots in the room? Okay. Anybody using Coolbots? Great. All right. A little bit on containers. Um, we, uh, there were a number of container uh, vendors on, in the expo. It was great to see some of, the, some of the variety that's available out there for nice storage uh, containers. Um, yeah, there, there is a, an increasing interest in moving away from wood, wood bins to plastic bins, uh, primarily for cleanability and uh, the ability to sanitize them. Um, and also there's a wide variety of smaller handheld uh, totes, uh, either for harvesting or storage or distribution. Um, one of the things Andy and I have been looking at is pre-cooling. Uh, some, some dedicated pre-cooling for small, medium-sized growers. So um, having a ventilated container or a vented container with uh, open sides uh, can be helpful for that um, and so that you can provide some in very intentional forced air uh, in a cooler to get, get the cool air into the center of the, the stored product right, before storage. Rodent pest control is another area where we've um, done a fair bit of work. Um, trying to find best practices and get them into a form that um, folks can, can use readily. Uh, one of the best practices we've seen is doing some intentional sealing, mechanical sealing at corners of any uh, storage room. Uh, so this can be done with hardware cloth, which is really uh, the big brother of window screen, um, just a, a higher gauge uh, uh, thread, um, and it's uh, welded at the seams. Uh, to make the screen, this thing that comes on a roll. Um, somebody told me recently they had good luck with uh, aluminum flashing, which might be easier to work with for some folks than uh, hardware cloth. Um, definitely wear gloves with this stuff. It chews up your hands. 
But the point is that any any place where you have a corner, uh, so up, up top where the uh, ceiling meets the wall, where walls meet each other, and where walls meet the floor, have some of this there, because those are the primary points where you have rodent entry into storage. Um, and so that's that's what we're trying to accomplish there. Or vents. Sorry? Vents? Vents yeah, as well, yeah, vents, great. So if you have some uh, intentional vents um, into or out of the space, having some rodent or bird exclusion <laughs> fil uh, filters, and they make them, they make them to, there's basically a PVC fitting that is made just for that purpose. So if your vent is made with PVC pipe, you're good to go. It's a pretty simple fix. Um, you, can, you can fashion one out of this material as well. The, the general approach to rodent pest control that we've sort of summarized in the fact sheet at that link is remove food, which re I realize seems counterintuitive for uh, farms. Um, the idea is not to remove the product, but to remove coal piles and um, scraps that might be on the floor from your uh, wash and pack operations uh, and get those to someplace away from the storage uh, space. Limit access, and so that's the point of this. Uh, approach is to make sure you don't have uh, seams where or corners where uh, pests can get in and then reduce population as a really a last resort um, to uh, baiting and trapping. So refrigeration uh, is, is really about pumping heat. We use a refrigerant to do this. I won't get too deep into this given the hour of the day but, and day of the week. But the, um, the point is that we're pumping heat from inside a cold room to uh, someplace which is warmer outside. And phase change of refrigerant allows us to do that. Um, and the way we control that process is by having a, a good thermostat. Um, it, generally, thermostats that are used in refrigeration installations are not great uh, for the purposes that, uh, that we want to be using them for. So I've done some review of what's available out there um, and what, what's ideal for storage systems. This is a quick summary of what, uh, where I've landed. There is a more detailed um, bit of information at the link listed in the upper right hand corner. Um, but the bottom line is I like a digital readout primarily because you want to be able to know what you're setting. If you have a dial thermostat, it's only as good as your eyes and as well as and as good as that dial is calibrated, which oftentimes is not very good. So a digital readout so you know what you set, a digital readout so you know what it's reading, right? You want to know what it's actually measuring in terms of temperature too. A remote bulb, which is the, the sensor that's coiled up on the sides of these things, that's the bulb, so that's the sensing piece of the thermostat. I recommend a remote bulb so that you can put that bulb either in anywhere you want in the room and your control panel can be outside the room. So you don't need to be inside the room to be checking temperature. Um, you can check it while you're walking by. It can even be in another building. Uh, these can be extended 200 to 300 feet depending on the right, if you have the right wire. So a remote bulb, a display that shows a setting and the actual condition, an output indicator. So these generally have an indication of whether or not it's calling for refrigeration or heat if you're using this for a heated room. Um, that's helpful for troubleshooting problems. If you note that the room is not where you want it to be, um, what's going on? Is the thermostat even asking for something to be done? If it is, then you, that helps you get closer to the problem more quickly. Um, remote monitoring and logging, uh, we, on, on, this, uh, on my site you can find a, a list of some remote monitoring options, things that let you know what your storage conditions are remotely, um, things that will tell you by email or text alert if you have a problem. Um, they can be quite handy. The other inexpensive, simple thing that I like to recommend is it have a good calibrated thermometer as part of your toolkit. And this is a Delta Track Instant Read thermometer. It's a $30 thing. It's great for grilling as well as storage. Um, and uh, follow USDA guidelines. Um, and uh, it's calibratable, so you can make a little ice, ice bath and you put, it, put this thing in there and you hit a calibrate button and you know that you've got close to 32 degrees, right? So that's really handy. So knowing conditions, especially temperature, very important. Cool bots are a very nice uh, low capital way of getting some refrigerated space and it sounds like we've got a 
bunch of folks already using them. Would anybody like to share some of your experiences using CoolBots? Wow, it's the best thing that sliced bread. Tell us about it. <laughs> All rosy. That's my perception. What's your perception? Yeah. Um, it was the, their first cooler setup we have is a bot. We have two now. And um, if, you, if you don't have one and you're interested in it, the people who run that company are so um, accessible. You can call them at any time. They will answer the phone. And they can usually diagnose if you have a problem over the phone. Um, and they're really quick to ship replacement parts if you have anything that goes down. Um, and we, we did it just by following their instructions, insulating a room, and then finally the units, and they've been, they've been great. That's great. It's great to hear. I, I'm not, um, I'm not easy to please when working with vendors. I love that company. It, it, I mean, what you just said, it, I mean, it's been my experience. You call them, they have an answer. They're responsive. Yeah, it's been nice. They're also, what I, what I really like about them is they're as quick to tell you if it's not the right thing for you as they are to say it's the right thing for you. So they, uh, one of the best things on their website is where CoolBots don't work well. And I think that's really, that's really great that they're able to, to identify that. Other experiences? Robots. Anybody have them fail? Actually, I'll have one more. <laughs> the, yeah. uh, you mentioned something in your talk yesterday or the other day about um, tipping the about tipping your air conditioner away from away from your space, which is I think critically important. And we find also that we in the in the back casing of the air conditioner, the part that hangs out of the cooler, we actually drill holes in there because there is an excessive amount of condensation. And if or even if you have a rainstorm and that area floods and sucks water into the system, the entire thing can ice over. And they can walk you through how to fix that as well. But making sure that water doesn't enter that system is pretty critically important. Thank you. That's great. You should do this talk. <laughs> did, did everybody hear her? Okay. okay, so the point she was making was, um, first thing she said was that the company that provides CoolBot, she's found to be uh, very responsive and supportive and, and getting you getting set up and helping you troubleshoot. The second thing she said was a point I made, uh, I think on Tuesday, with CoolBots, air conditioners in general are meant to go in a window and be pitched slightly out. So if this is, if this is the inside, it should be pitched a little bit like this, away from the wall. The point being, they have an evaporator in them too, just like any other refrigeration system. And we already discussed that evaporators condense water. Um, and so, especially when you're running an air conditioner at a lower temperature than where it was really intended to run, it's gonna drop even more water. So now you don't have a lukewarm glass of water, you have an ice cold glass of water, right? So you're dropping a lot of water into that bottom pan of an air conditioner. Um, they used to all have drain holes in the bottom of them bottom of them, but a lot of air conditioners now have um, uh, basically a reheat section that eva tries to evaporate that water out, which works fine if you're trying to maintain 60 degree room temperature you know, as an air conditioner, but if you're trying to maintain 34 degree refrigeration temperature, you've got way more water to deal with than you can, you can do that. And so the point of pitching it away from the wall and making sure you have a weep hole for that water to drain out of outside is, is, is a great one. And also check it, um, especially in the fall going into the winter, it tends to be, it's amazing where leaves can land and settle. And the, the, the bottom pan of an air conditioner just collects all sorts of stuff. So just, it's a good maintenance thing. Check on the fins, make sure you've got plenty of uh, ability for airflow to get rid of heat. And also check the bottom pan to make sure it's not clogged up with stuff. Great. I, I, I think one of my big concerns is if I'm making a delivery and I've got a thermoking reefer and I know the temperature of my product and I'm delivering to a guy that has a cool box, I, I just I have a feeling like they're not running a disc and there's, you know, it, it, there's only so much that thing can do. Yeah, so, and, and that's one of, the, one of the things about Store Cold, the company that makes it, is they're, they're, very, they're very good about saying, you know, if you have a lot of door openings, if you have a lot of field heat coming in, um, if you're trying to maintain temperatures before, below 34 degrees, we're not your product, you know? And so they are really good about that. Now, does that mean everybody listens to that? No, it, you know, folks will try to do whatever folks will try to do. Um, so as somebody delivering into somebody else's cold chain, I think you're, you're right to be concerned about whether they're maintaining that well or not. Um, 
there's nothing inherently wrong with a cool bot maintaining temperature, but if you're bringing in something with a lot of field heat, if you've got a lot of door openings, you might want to think about how you're handling that, yeah. They can be ganged together too. You can have a, a room with multiple window air, air conditioners and cool bots to increase capacity, uh, cooling capacity. Um, some pros and cons, so cool bots are a low initial cost. Um, they're easy to retrofit into existing spaces and uh, some, some people have pointed out potential efficiency benefit. In the studies I've seen, um, it's, not, it's not huge. It's kind of in the wash, which makes sense. Uh, from an engineering perspective, a cool bot is doing the same thing as a split refrigeration system. It's just slightly different size. Um, so there shouldn't really be much of an energy efficiency benefit. On the downside, they can be slow to pull down temperature. Uh, they are slow to pull down temperature. They're essentially less horsepower uh, than a uh, split system. Um, so that's where that lands. You can't get below really 34, 35 degrees without them freezing up. Um, so measuring and monitoring conditions can be simple. It can be a set of clipboards and somebody checking on conditions. Um, it can be a dial, an analog dial, um, um, uh, thermometer or, and humidity, uh, hygrometer. Um, I've mentioned before about a calibrated therm uh, thermometer. The thing on the bottom there is a sling psychrometer. That's uh, really the kind of gold standard for uh, measuring humidity. It measures dry bulb temperature, which is the temperature we all know and love and also measures wet bulb temperature, which is a, the temperature that you get a thermometer to if you move a moistened wick around in, in, uh, in air. It evaporates a certain amount of water um, into the air and drops the temperature down. And so you compare those two temperatures and you get humidity as a result. Um, there are some higher tech options out there. These are um, on the upper right hand side are, is a USB um, stick that you can actually, uh, it'll log temperature and humidity, uh, and then you can download the data. Um, Sensophone, if anybody grows in greenhouses, they're probably familiar with that uh, brand. Mogile is one that I've used for a number of uh, demonstration sites, um, which is it's a cloud-based system, so it, me it measures the conditions, puts it up onto the internet, and then you can get at it anywhere you have web access. You can set up notifications to let you know, it'll let you know if you exceed certain thresholds, either high or low. Um, and the, the one on the bottom right here is uh, the Vesta Do Right, uh, D E W Right. Um, and this is a company I'm actually working with to um, uh, develop and distribute a uh, wet bulb, dry bulb psychrometer that's electronic. So instead of a sling psychrometer, you being in the room, taking that relative humidity measurement, it's doing this for you and uh, puts the data on the, on the web. No problem. Um, there's also really simple monitoring options too. And this is a, I saw this in a very large distribu distribution center in California uh, who had gobs of electronic monitoring systems and I asked the general manager, you know, what do you think about your monitoring systems? It looks really cool, a lot of flashing lights and computers and he points up to this thing and goes, that's still what I trust. You know, so it's this, this dial thermometer and they had put red and green tape on their, uh, you know, green tape where their ideal conditions were. And he said, what I like about that is every single fork truck driver, fork truck driver in this place knows to look at that as they go through the door. You know, so that's his monitoring system. He's, he's developed a culture of uh, conditions. So again, wrap it up. These are the top 10 things um, that hopefully we've covered. Um, there were some, did I, did I capture all, did I get to all the points that people had? Remind me. We okay? Yeah. Other questions? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Clean, uh, so storing clean versus uh, dirty. Um, and the way I would sum that up is, let's say it's a root crop uh, that you're storing. Um, do you wash beef, uh, carrots or potatoes before going into storage? The, the main thing that drives that, uh, at least in our climate, is whether you have heated uh, wash pack space. Um, and so it, it really seems to be an operational thing rather than 
a, um, a product quality thing, you can do it well either way. If you wash before going into storage, it's important to make sure you wash, and then if it's a crop that needs curing, like potatoes, if you wash, you are generally going to be potentially damaging uh, the crop a little bit. So make sure you provide some intentional curing time after washing and good drying time for just about anything. So if you wash carrots before going into storage, give them a bit of drip time and a bit of drying time uh, before maybe bagging them. Um, you know, you don't want lots of extra liquid water going into storage with the crop. Does that help? Does Handbook 66 give uh, in-depth recommendations for other crops like uh, green beans and peas that would enable a uh, grower, packer, shipper to build the kind of uh, storage that they need? Short answer is yes. It's uh, Handbook 66 really is built around um, larger scale uh, long shipping um, operations and so you can learn from that and then scale it to a small to mid scale, mid -scale size operation. That's what I've tried to do. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. We could have made this a very quick talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're yeah, I mean what I do is I look at the handbook sixty six guides and then think about, you know, storage duration by grower and what infrastructure they have available to them to accomplish it. The other thing I found is, um, you know, some of the guidance is, the relevance of some of the guidance is limited because of that. So for example, if I have a small grower who's doing a couple acres of potatoes and destined for a table stock, they don't necessarily need to follow the guidance for chipping and frying, right? So that they have a little bit more flexibility because of their market. So that's good to know. Um, but the curing guidance, still great, great guidance. So. Uh, winter squash is another one. I need to talk with the editor of Handbook 66 about this one. There's some winter squash information in there that um, I think is a little bit misinterpreted. Uh, in particular, it says that there's no curing benefit. There's no benefit to curing squash. The studies that they're referring to are actually, when you look at them, and they're Cornell studies from 1934, what could go wrong? Um, the, uh, they actually say that there's no benefit to curing when you store in other than optimal conditions. Uh, so they were looking at, the, the researchers were looking at um, how do we store winter squash in a storage room designed for lower temperature, higher humidity. Maybe if we cure them, it'll benefit, but the, the conclusion was no. Well, one of the things that, that didn't come up, I don't know if there's any onion growers in here, but in some parts of the world, onions are not allowed to be sprayed for a sprout inhibitor, and so what they do is they dry and then they chill, mm. and then they keep those onions, you know, just above 32 degrees, and then uh, and that's how they're stored and then they're brought to market. All of that, in looking at storage of of certain crops and how exact it is, it, it's there's more to this than than. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just got into this, I figured it'd be basically a collection project, you know, collect the work other people have done and make sure it gets out that there's still so, I and mean, we've been doing this a long time, right, storing crops, there's still so much, uh, that there really are some very interesting uh, research questions that, that I have, just, and the, the more I learn, the more I want to know, so, yeah, thanks for appreciating that. With like pool box and stuff like that, are you concerned with like vapor barriers at all? Like if your things don't rot out? Great question. So vapor barriers in cooler construction. Um, so general guidance for, with vapor barriers is put the vapor barrier where the dew point is likely to, to result in condensation. On a cooler that's used year round, guess where that is? Outside. Both sides. Both sides, yeah. So in the winter, uh, it's going to tend to be on the inside, and in the summer, it's going to tend to be on the outside. The um, and so I, you know, I landed on this I, saying I'm pretty sure when you have vapor barrier on both sides, and I talked to building scientists, and they're like, "What are you talking about? No, you only have vapor barrier on one side," which is true for an occupied building, right? So in, in an occupied building where you're in one climate condition, that's true. Start looking at any of the prefab coolers. Where's their vapor barrier? All around, right? 
a panel, like a, an insulated panel, you've got a vapor barrier on both sides. So it comes down, I think, my, my guidance is vapor barrier on both sides, seal it really well. If you can use uh, prefab panels, do so because they're really well sealed. Um, but yeah, I, my point is keep moisture out of the cavity from both sides. Okay. Hope that helps. Okay, shall we think? Thanks. Thanks.